David, um, let's move on and talk about the complications and the challenges associated with sequencing. So we've just talked extensively about treating the frontline patient, newly diagnosed. We've had a very rigorous discussion about side effects, efficacy, choice of agents. Um, so some of the challenges for our community doctors are, one, when is it time to change? And how do you decide when a second line agent is really appropriate? And then what's the conversation going to start to sound like when choosing a second line agent. So, so please address that as well as integrating the imaging in our decision making about what is truly progression versus a radiographic change that may or may not justify a changing of an agent. So I think there are certain situations where that decision is relatively straightforward. So if a patient is on a TKI on the front line and they you get a scan and there's new lesions, for example, that person needs another therapy, in my mind. If the patient has symptoms of, you know, progression, you know, in some ways, regardless of the scan, if they feel worse, they have new pain, new cough, something like that, that patient needs a, another therapy. I think the places where we all struggle are in the patients that are feeling well, they're now tolerating the dose and schedule of whatever they were on because you've figured it out with your personalized medicine, a la Dr. George. Um, and, but their scans are worse. You know, how much worse is enough? They don't have new lesions, but they have growth. I mean, we have a bias in many of, certainly in our center, because we have trials for those patients. We have a bias to sort of maybe pull the trigger on a second line therapy maybe sooner than in the community where you're trying to extend the benefit of any one drug. But we roughly try to use resist criteria, but we're not strict adherence to that in, even in our practice. But I, we like to move on when we see significant growth, I'd say, you know, 20, 30 percent growth of the lesions that exist. And then when you ask the question of what to choose next, I think, uh, you know, I obviously have, our group obviously has somewhat of a, you know, relative bias towards immunotherapy for patients, both in the front line, as Dan mentioned, with IL-2, but also in the second line with, you know, PD-1 blockade with nivolumab. I think the data from the, the NEVO 025 phase three trial is about as clean a trial as we've ever seen in the second line in kidney cancer where you get clear benefits and overall survival over Everolimus where you get improvements not only in safety, you know, decreased toxicity relative to Everolimus, but also improvements in quality of life which likely reflect both things, less tox and clinical benefit. So, from our point of view, that trial sort of confirms our bias to switch people in that direction. But it would be nice in some ways to compare, which we don't have, a comparison of checkpoint blockade with the TKI in second line. We don't have that data. For some patients, that might be the right approach. And it's hard to argue that it's not right for some patients. We just can't tell who, you know, who should do which sequence. But I think, um, in our practice, we choose that set, we use that second TKI for after they've had a chance to receive uh, NEVO. So David, I'm, I'm gonna put you on the spot because you've got a lot of experience in this area. Um, suppose tomorrow we had an immuno-oncology agent in the frontline setting, and you've just articulated very nicely the use of WHO and rhesus criteria for PD, and there's a whole group of efforts, including some that you're involved in, which are called immune-related response criteria, or IRRC. Um, how do you envision using that to make a decision about when to choose a second-line therapy? And how do you do it in patients that are on clinical trials in the frontline setting and then need second-line treatment? And how are those patients analyzed? So that's an advanced placement kind of question right there. <laughs> the, um, yeah, I, I think it's going, it's going to be hard. Um, assuming we have frontline approvals for some of these combinations, which we'll have to wait for, that's an assumption. I think most of us in practice outside of a trial will make that switch, whether it's frontline failure of PD-1 based therapy or even second line uh, failure, is do patients develop new symptoms? In those patients, I've never seen a case of pseudo progression where the patient felt worse, personally. So in, in the best cases of pseudoprogression I've seen, I've seen new lesions, but the patient comes in feeling great. So, so let's, let's define 
and uh, in the context of this conversation, and yep. you have some presentations at, at ASCA this year, mm -hmm. define for us what pseudo progression is, how you characterize it, and what you do with that information, even in the context of a clinical trial. Right, so pseudo progression or an unconventional response has been classified as developing new lesions, for example, in the presence of decline of the original lesion. So you're, the stuff you started with is smaller, but you develop new things. Or in the setting of um, you know, a, an overall decline um, after a progression. So a growth in lesions that then subsequently leads to um, a, a shrinkage. That situation is more difficult to manage in, in, in my experience because most of the patients who actually grow initially are, real, are going to be true progressors. Those are going to be patients who are going to need something else. So whenever I see growth on a scan, I don't assume unconventional response. I don't con assume pseudoprogression. I assume it's going to be real progression and we're already starting the discussion of what are we going to do next. But then we try to give the benefit of the doubt if the patient is not deteriorating symptomatically and say, let's come back in six weeks or eight weeks with another scan. If that scan looks worse, we're going to do X. If not, we're going to feel good because there's, there's some benefit to continuing treatment beyond progression. I think some of our, what makes it hard is some of our best responses on some of those early trials. Some of the people we remember the most are the people who originally grew and then had a dramatic shrinkage or developed new lesions and then to have a shrinkage. But most patients with growth on scans are really going to be true progressors. We have to keep in mind that with Nevo, the best response for more than a third of patients was progressive disease. So we have to be aware that both things are possible and make sure we don't uh, prevent patients from going on to a, a, another therapy because they deteriorate while you're waiting for that next scan. Yeah. So, so can I ask? Yeah. I, I think there's a couple of key points that you bring up here. And one is that you, know, you don't necessarily have um, have to see evidence of a disease of response immediately. Right. You know, some of these patients are coming off a of VEGF inhibitor. There could be a rebound effect. Mm -hmm. You know, there could be, hey, just just removing that VEGF inhibition, having that that angiogenic growth factor come back. There could be some growth of existing lesions, maybe even a new lesion that wasn't that was sort of right. there but not really apparent till it got reperfused. So I'm always kind of careful about that. But when we see multiple new lesions, new organ sites involved, symptoms or you know, impending issues or complications, that's when we get really nervous about this. I think the other key point is that you don't necessarily need a PR to get a clinical benefit right. from that agent. Absolutely. And, and what you've seen, what we've seen in the data with stable disease and even that, that, that overall survival in patients who have had, you know, stable disease or progressive disease as their best response really speaks to the fact that this may be working in an unconventional timing or way right. that's not going to necessarily cause that sort of traditional tumor regression. Right. I mean, that, because it's not direct treat, treatment. Right. It's indirect treatment. Right, and that's what we're seeing, we think, in the, those responses, meaning you, the growing new lesions um, are, we think, inflammation surrounding lesions that weren't recognized by the immune system that now can be recognized because the T cells can actually get there and kill the tumor. I mean, this was first noted in the CTLA-4 experience with ipilimumab, but we saw patients with new brain mets in melanoma, and we said, this has to be disease, so let's take these patients to the operating room, only to find that when those lesions were removed, they were dead melanoma. So in some cases, what you're seeing as worsening on the scans is really the, the effect of the drug, a T cell response to the tumor.